Okay, next step is that we're going to have the CSC PE to CSC CE routing between router one, uh, router two is the PE, router one is the CE. And then we're going to be running IGP plus LDP. So in this case, we're going to create a new OSPF process. It's going to be just for that customer. And we're going to enable LDP on the interface as well. So on router one, we're going to go to its loopback. And on loopback zero, we have IP OSPF 111, area zero. On interface gig 1.12, same thing. Under the interface, we're going to say MPLS IP. Okay, that's enabling LDP just on that one specific link. Okay, then on router 2, we're going to go to interface gig 1.12 and say IP OSPF 100 area, or uh, 111, area 0, and IP, uh, IP no, uh, MPLS IP. Okay, if we then show run interface gig 1.12, the difference here from this versus a normal L3 VPN config is that when MPLS is on the interface, it's running as VRF aware. So we should eventually get a log message here that we form an LDP adjacency to the customer router, but we're going to see that it's talking about it within that specific VRF. So if we look at the show IP OSPF neighbors, we have two different processes. We have the global process plus the VRF process. And we'd have to separate these by saying show IP OSPF 1 neighbors versus show IP OSPF 111 neighbors. And then notice now we get the LDP log that in VRF CSC we have that particular neighbor. So this also means that when we look at the show MPLS LDP neighbors, this only shows the neighbors that are in the global table. When we verify both the label uh, neighbors plus the label forwarding table, we now need to make sure that this command is VRF aware. So on the CSC PE, we need to say show MPLS LDP neighbors for VRF CSC. And we can see now we have a TCP connection going to router one's loopback, and it's coming from that physical interface on router two side that is in the VRF. Okay, if we then look at the show MPLS forwarding table, that's talking about the core network. If we show MPLS forwarding table for VRF CSC, this is talking about just the customer's table. Okay, so notice here the capital V here, this is, means it's a, v, it's a VPN router, it's a VRF aware label. Normally, in a uh, regular L3 VPN config, the link to the customer would say unlabeled or no label. That means you're sending the traffic as native IPv4. But in our particular case here, this traffic is going to be labeled as it's going from CSC PE to CSC CE. Okay, then on XR1, we're going to advertise its loopback into BGP. So under XR1, we're going to go to, let's say, show run router BGP. We're going to go to address family IPv4 unicast. And we have a network statement for our own loopback. 11, 11, 11, 11, slash 32. Okay, now from the core carrier's point of view, which again is router 2 and XR2, they should see this route coming in as a VPN v4 route. So from XR2, if we look at the show BGP VPN v4 unicast all, or just unicast, we should see here shortly that we're going to learn 11, 11, 11, 11. Uh, this should also appear in show BGP VRF CSC IPv4 labeled unicast. And XR1, let's make sure that that is getting advertised. Show BGP IPv4 labeled unicast. Okay, we're advertising the route. Let's see on the other end. Okay, now we're receiving it. So it's, it's coming in the VRF as a labeled prefix, but we're then automatically importing it into BGP based on the whatever route target policy that we're creating. So again, when you're running BGP with the customer, you don't need to redistribute BGP into BGP. It does that automatically. But on the other end, since we're running OSPF and BGP, we will need to redistribute between those two. 
So now if we go to router two and show BGP, VPN v4, unicast, all, we see the route to 11. If we show IP route VRF CSC, that 11 prefix should have got imported, but we now need to export this. We need to redistribute OSPF into BGP in order to export it. So let's say under router OSPF 111, okay, that's in the VRF, we're going to redistribute BGP1 subnets. Under BGP1, under address family IPv4 VRF CSC, we're going to redistribute OSPF 111. Okay, now if we look at the VPNv4 routes, show BGP, VPNv4, unicast all, we can see now we're advertising 1111. Okay, this should now mean that XR1 and router 1 have IP transport to each other. So if we ping 11, 11, 11, 11, sourced from 1111, we can reach them. But more importantly, if we do a trace route, we should see that this path is now using a two-label stack as it is routing over the L3 VPN core. So just like a regular L3 VPN, we have the transport label and we have the VPN label, but the difference is the transport label extends all the way to the link from the CSC uh, PE to the CSC CE. So let's look at this from a packet capture point of view. Okay, so in Wireshark, let's start our capture, and let's say we're looking for packets that have an IP.source that is equal to 10.1.2.1. Okay, this is router 1. So we see router 1 is generating OSPF packets that are going to the provider. It's also generating LDP. If we then do a ping from router 1 to XR1, okay, that's ping 11... 11.11, we'll just say that this is, uh, repeat is just one packet. We should see that we have the, or actually, no, I sourced this from something else. I said the source was 1111. This is the ICMP echo, okay, which is this one. And it's going one, two, three, four, five, six different hops. Okay, if we look at in the diagram, it is going here, one, two, three, four, five, six hops. Okay, the first packet here normally is a regular IP packet, but in our case, we can see it is label encapsulated. Specifically, it's using label number 24, which is going to be the LDP label from our point of view but it's going to be the BGP label from the other device's point of view. So what I mean by this is that if we were to go to the other end, which in this case is router 2, and on router 2 we look at what does label 24 actually mean? And we show MPLS forwarding table. It says label number 24. We're going to swap it to 16,006 and it's going towards the final destination of 11, 11, 11, 11. But once this goes into router 2, and then router 2 sends it the next hop into the core, notice that we did two things that we don't normally do. We swapped the VPN label, and we pushed a new transport label on top. Okay, so originally the label number was 24. We swapped 24 to 16,003 and we pushed label 21. Okay, the reason why is that router 2 is running LDP with router 1, but it's running VPN v4 BGP with XR2. So if we look at what is our route, show IP route VRF CSC to get to 11, 11, 11, 11, our route is learned through VPN v4 BGP. But from the customer's point of view, we show IP route 11, 11, 11, 11. They're receiving it from IGP. So this means that one end is using an LDP based label, the other side is using a VPN v4 based label. And there's no special configuration you need, you need to do for this. It's automatically going to convert it as long as you have LDP on the CSC PE link facing towards the customer. But again, this configuration is only supported in iOS. XR has to run this as BGP. 
Okay, it then goes into the core of the network. If we look at it in uh, the fourth hop here, okay, the fourth hop is when router 7 is sending it out to, uh, to XR3. We can see that the inner label is 16,003. This is the VPN label that router 2 swapped from label number 24. So it's keeping this VPN label as it goes along the core, 16,003. And then we'll see when it goes to the last hop, as it's going from XR2 out to XR1, 16,003 is going to be the BGP bound label that we are originating from uh, the other end. So if we go to XR2 and look at the show BGP, VRF, CSC, IPv4, unicast labels, this is the key difference in this type of design. That we're generating BGP labels, but we're generating them inside of the VRF. In the previous example, when we were doing option C, it was doing BGP plus label, but it was doing BGP plus label in the global routing table as opposed to inside of the VRF. So if we look at where is this number specifically coming from, 16,003, this is the local label that we are generating. Say when I forward traffic to 11, I'm going to use this label number outbound. Okay, that's why we see that number as the very last label in the stack as it goes towards the, uh, towards the destination. Okay, when we look at this from XR1's point of view, and we show BGP IPv4 label unicast for 11, 11, 11, 11, slash 32, it says that we have allocated local label number three. Okay, we'll see where this is going to come in in our, uh, our, our next uh, case. Okay, so now we're to the point where we have label transport all the way from XR1 to router 1. Again, like we talked about in our regular L3 VPN designs, before we can do the VPN v4 peering, we have to make sure that we can trace between the neighbors and that it's following a label path. So from XR1, if we trace to 1111, sourced from 11, 11, 11, 11, following a label path end to end. Okay, now we can configure them as VPN v4 peers. So under router BGP 111, we're going to peer to the neighbor 1111. The remote AS is 111, so it's an iBGP peer. The update source is loopback 0. And the address family is VPN v4. Okay, this also means that under global BGP, VPN v4 is enabled. If we show config, this is just a regular VPN v4 peering. Okay, from router 1's point of view, we're going to do the same thing. And so we have router BGB 111. Neighbor is 11, 11, 11, 11. They're an iBGP peer. Update source is loopback 0. And the address family is VPN v4 unicast. Okay, so activate the neighbor. Okay, this message here, this notification, this just means one neighbor has the AFI configured, the other one does not. So in terms of troubleshooting, this syslog should be a pretty easy notification that there is uh, a problem with the, the neighbor statements between them. So maybe one side you have IPv6, the other side you have IPv4. You need to match whatever the AFIs are in order to, uh, to form the peering. Okay, now the peer is up. Okay, next we're going to configure the second VRF. So we have the first VRF here, which is CSC. Now we're going to configure the other VRF from router 1 and XR1 down to the final customer. So we'll say that this is going to be VRF A. So from router 1, we're going to globally define VRF A. So VRF definition A, we'll say the route distinguisher is 111 colon 111. The route target is both 111, 111. And address family is IPv4 and IPv6. If we show run interface gig1.14, this interface is going to have VRF forwarding A. And then we're reapplying IP.
Okay, XR1 is going to do the same thing. So we're creating the VRF, VRF A. Address family is IPv4 and IPv6. Six unicast. And we're going to say the route target import and export policy. Import route target is... 111111, export route target, same thing. Okay, so we're going to do, do this under both AFIs. Okay, commit the changes, we save the VRF, so now let's look at the interface. Let's show run interface gig 0000.4111. Okay, here I'm just going to delete the interface. commit, and then recreate the interface, apply the VRF, VRF A, and then paste the rest of the config. Okay, so this is another alternative as opposed to doing this in a single commit. Deleting the interface deletes all of its config, and then you could just copy and paste whatever else was on there after you apply the, uh, the VRF. Okay, this is assuming it's a logical sub-interface, not a physical interface. Can't delete a physical interface. Okay, so next uh, we're going to have the routing protocol that goes down to the final customer. Okay, so let's say in this case we're going to run eHRP. So on router 4, we're going to uh, disable these other interfaces. So gig 146 and gig 145, those, I'm going I'm to shut those down. Interface gig 146 and 45 shut. And then let's just say router eHRP1 network 0000. No auto summary. Okay, so we're just enabling eHRP on all of the links. Okay, same is going to be true from router 5's point of view. So interface gig 145 is shut down, gig 156 is shut down, and eHRP is enabled everywhere. Okay, from router 1's point of view, this is a VRF aware config. So we're going to say router e address A. The address family has IPv4 VRF A. The autonomous system is, uh, what did I call it? One. And we're just enabling it on all of the links in the VRF. Okay, we should get a log message here that we form adjacency with router five. If we do show IP route VRF A, we should see five's loop back. Okay, then on XR1, we're going to do eHRP over to router 4. So router eHRP A, address family is IPv4 VRF A. The, or no, just VRF A. Uh, address family is IPv4. The autonomous system is 1. And the interfaces are gig 0000411. If we then look at the eHRP neighbors, this would be show eHRP uh, config failed. Show config fail. Invalid eHRP virtual name. Configuration has not been verified. What went wrong here? Okay, the link is in the VRF. Uh, let me abort and try this one over. Okay, so let's say router eHRP A, commit. Show config. Fail. Invalid eHRP virtual instance name. I think it, what it is is that I need to put an autonomous system number for the global process. So let's say router eHRP A, VRF A, that's why. Okay, if we show config, now say autonomous system uh, under the address family, IPv4 autonomous system. 
commit. Now, I think what this means is I have to put an AS number under the global process. So let's say address family IPv4, autonomous system, uh, 65535. Show config fail. Let me do it this way. Let's say router EHRP 65535. Configuring the autonomous system for, okay, so that we need to say this. Basically what it is is that the iOS XR syntax behaves like the a legacy version of eHRP on iOS that I need to, all right, let me abort this and do it one more time. So I need to say uh, router eHRP 65535, uh, VRFA, address family IPv4, autonomous system is one. Autonomous system one. Do show run router EHRP. Okay, we're in the case of regular iOS. If we compare this config to router one, do show run section EHRP. In regular iOS, this named process doesn't need an AS unless you enable the uh, address family for global unicast. But in the case of XR, it does require one just like it did in uh, iOS if you said router EHRP one. So if I were to route this globally, I would have to use 65535, and then I'm enabling it under the, uh, the AS. But again, this is the type of stuff that you can't let trip you up in the exam. You have to make sure you know this syntax offhand, because if you can't get basic routing working, then, I mean, you, may, you could probably get it from doing the documentation, but you're not gonna have enough time to do that. You need to make sure that these type of configs, that you can basically, you know, pretty much do them in your sleep. Okay, so we have, it, uh, we have it configured. I need to enable it on the link now. So the link is going to be interface gig 0000.411. Commit. Okay, let's say show EHRP VRF A. Let's say all neighbors. Okay, now the neighbor's up. Okay, if we look at the show route for VRF A, okay, we have the customer's routes. Okay, the final step then is the redistribution between IGP and BGP on the final uh, CEs, which in this case are router one and uh, XR1. So this, there's nothing special in terms of the redistribution. It's just the same as you would do in normal L3 VPN. Then we, and if someone had asked here the previous error message, it was not related to IPv6. I'm gonna come back to IPv6 in our next section, and we'll look at doing six VPE over this type of design. And 6VPE is going to be very simple. It's going to be just basically one extra command in order to get this to, uh, to work. But in uh, XR1, I need to redistribute between these two processes. So let's just show run. And this is going to go between BGP under the VRF, which is VRF A. It's not defined yet. Uh, and then it's going to be under EHRP. So let's say under router EHRP, VRF A, address family IPv4, we're going to redistribute BGP111. And that's it. Okay, then under BGB111, we're going to go to uh, VRF A, give it a route distinguisher, so we'll say 111 colon 111. Address family is IPv4, and then we're going to redistribute EHRP 65535. Okay, if we show BGP VPN v4 unicast, we should see that we're going to get router 4's loopback into the BGB process. 
Okay, let's do this on the other end and then come back to this. So on router one, let's go to eidrpa A, and then redistribute, uh, that goes under topology base, redistribute BGP111. Under BGP111, under address family IPv4 VRFA, we need to redistribute uh, EHRP A. EHRP what? One. And actually, I think on, on XR I called it the wrong. This I should have said uh, redistribute EHRP one. So let me say show on XR, let's say show config rollback last one, uh, changes last one. Okay, let's roll, roll this back. Uh, rollback config last one. And then what this should have said was, Redistribute EHRP one. Okay, commit and then show BGP VPN v4 unicast. Okay, so now the routes are in. Okay, so now we see between four and five. Okay, if we go to the final customer, which is four, and look at the show IP route, from their perspective in the global table, they just see regular EHRP routes because when we're going from eHRP into VPN v4 BGP, we're encoding these with the BGP cost community, basically the eHRP vector attributes in the BGP update. So I didn't need to set a metric as I was going BGP to eHRP and back. Okay, now we need to test connectivity. So let's ping to 5555. Source is loopback zero. Okay, we have connectivity. But what's important here is what does the label path look like when we're going between the two? So what we should see happen now is that when the, the packet comes in from router 4 to XR1, XR1 does a lookup on the final destination. And it says the, the uh, destination is 5555. I learned this as a VPN v4 route via router 1. So I'm going to take whatever the IP packet is. So I'm going to take the ping, and I'm going to put the VPN label on it. I then need to figure out what is the transport label. The transport label is to the loopback of router one. So I take the VPN label, I put the transport label on top of it. We send this out to XR2. XR2 is gonna take that transport label and it is going to swap it to the CSC CE VPN label. It is then going to impose a new VPN, or excuse me, it's going to leave the original VPN label alone with the IP packet, and then it's going to put a new transport label that is talking about router 2's loopback. So we should see the top label change, the bottom label stay the same, and then two new labels imposed when the traffic gets to XR2. So we'll basically see a three label stack when the traffic is received on router 7. Okay, there's a question here, where does, where does XR1 get the transport label from? The transport label is coming from BGP plus label. It's that IPv4 labeled unicast pairing that's going between XR1 and XR2.